Okay, I think it's ready to go. We're ready to go. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Rich Corsi, and I serve as the Dean of the College of Engineering at UC Davis. And on behalf of the college, I'm excited to welcome you to the first Dean's Distinguished Speaker event of this academic year. Thank you for attending what is guaranteed to be a fantastic learning experience. Um, I'm pleased to introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Teresa Maldonado, who will present her lecture entitled, Engineering Frameworks for Real Impact. And we all know that engineers make real impact, right? Dr. Maldonado is the Vice President for Research and Innovation at the University of California Office of the President. In this role, she harnesses the power of UC for collective impact in research, research translation, innovation, and policy. Prior to joining UCOP, Dr. Maldonado served as Dean of Engineering at the University of Texas at El Paso. She also worked for more than a decade at Texas A&M University, I think 12 years to be exact, at Texas A&M University. And at both universities, she was a tenured professor of electrical and computer engineering. Dr. Maldonado also has extensive experience at the federal level with significant involvement in the National Science Foundation. At NSF, she engaged in advancing engineering research centers, education, and commercialization initiatives. A three-time graduate of the Georgia Institute of Technology, Dr. Maldonado's research background is in nonlinear optical devices and materials, electromagnetics, and optical fiber technologies. Dr. Maldonado is a trailblazer in the engineering field. She was the first Mexican-American and only the fourth female to earn a PhD from the, from the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Georgia Tech. We're so grateful to have her with us today to share her knowledge and expertise. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Teresa Maldonado. Thank you so much, Rich. And thank you for um, having me here at UC Davis. Uh, in my conversations this morning, um, I think some of you could actually join me up on the stage to share in some of my comments. Um, this, my topic today is really something that evolved, uh, especially my work at the national level, um, in really taking a deep dive into our profession as engineers and, and to explore how we can make more meaningful impact. So, I'm starting off with this image, and I go back to John F. Kennedy with his moonshot speech, where he really challenged the United States uh, to go to the moon by the end of the 1960s and to bring man back safely. Now, this moonshot message, for those of us who remember it, <laughs> um, actually impacts engineering profession today. And I'm gonna thread this, um, this theme throughout. But what happened back then, and I'm real big on context, as you'll uh, learn. Uh, if you go back to Sputnik, for example, go back five years, uh, Dwight Eisenhower was the president, a Republican. And when Sputnik went up, there was all these alarms in the United States, like, um, oh, you know, the, the U.S. is already falling behind. But there was a lot of discussion about education back then and how we were educating um, our workforce. So really, the entire citizenry in the United States was rattled by this event. So in 1962, John F. Kennedy made this declaration and this challenge. And when you think about it, seven years later, we achieved this goal, and this was a, a, a bodacious goal. When you think about the context, we had limited computational and software capabilities back then. We also had a lot of um, uh, horrific assassinations happening, both political and um, civil rights. Uh, JFK, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and, and many others. So there was persistent social unrest, and we can almost map it to today when you think about it. We had the Vietnam War going on. Um, and then John, uh, President Johnson, okay, Kennedy was Democrat, Johnson's Democrat. So you see a change in parties, but there was never a loss on the focus to the goal. So Johnson in 1965 passed the Great Society to aid in education, battle poverty, and ensure voting rights for everyone. 
So look back then, we have Sputnik, and we have all this flux going on in the United States. But this moonshot achievement was a national priority. We, had, we shared in a multi-year vision. We had fire in the belly. We had real focus. We had tolerance for high risk and failure. We tend to shy away from risk and failure. There were interdisciplinary teams that had to form to get this goal accomplished. And we would not have accomplished this goal without hidden figures. The African-American women at NASA, which, who by the way, I did not learn about until the movie came out. I had no idea about these women. So I'll begin the presentation talking a little bit about my perspective, um, a little bit about my background, what I do at the UC Office of the President, and talk about the engineering profession. And I will tell you that National Science Foundation is in deep discussions about our profession, as are the other federal agencies and industry. And then I'll conclude uh, to talk about some of these frameworks, which is the topic of this presentation. So um, a little bit about my background. I actually organized my professional life in a quad chart. I figured you could relate to that. <laughs> so I am educated. Um, I am first in my family to attend college and earn a degree. So I have a two-year degree where I changed majors three times. I um, grew up in the Air Force, so that's how I landed in Georgia. I was actually born at Travis Air Force Base down the street here. Um, but uh, so I ended up getting a two-year degree in mathematics and one of my professors there suggested that I try Georgia Tech so I have that transfer student experience. I did very well. I picked electrical because the undergraduate advisor actually smiled and uh, that's no joke and um, the others were pretty chilly. Um, so I did attend 14 schools K through 12 two-year degree landed at Georgia Tech and I did have a high GPA so AT&T Bell Laboratories uh, recruited me and said, um, we'd like to hire you, but you have to have a master's degree. So they sent me back to school, all expenses paid. And for those of you who may recall, that's called the one year on campus program. It doesn't exist anymore. So that's how I decided to go to graduate school. And so I went back to Georgia Tech and then I have a lot of stories in there, but my PhD advisor taught a couple of my master's courses and um, he kept writing me letters asking me to come back. So um, I did work in industry between my master's and PhD. And um, so if you, on the lower left, I started off my academic career at UT Arlington. Um, I was married at the time. and. We had a two-body opportunity. My ex-husband and I are in the same department. But uh, back then, UTA was an R2 institution. But in my first year there, I was um, awarded um, the NSF Presidential Young Investigator Award. And the campus had no idea what to do with me. And so I had to figure out how to navigate that very important grant on my own. And um, so I, but I was the only female in the department and the only underrepresented minority in the entire College of Engineering. But what happened as I progressed in my academic life, um, really I've been a professor, like full-blown professor for nine years. I kept, NSF called me in 1999, asked me to interview there. So I kept taking these opportunities, but I stayed in higher ed. When I came back, Texas A&M came after me and so on and so forth. Then I have experience at the system, and what I came to realize is that, um, you know, engineers actually have strong leadership skills, and that's what higher ed is looking for. Your chancellor is an electrical engineer, and uh, a lot of vice chancellors for research and some of our other leaders across UC are engineers. So that's something to keep in mind, but this is my context. Okay, so a couple of things that I've done in terms of uh, building partnerships at Texas A&M. Um, probably about 2005, I had the idea to establish a campus-wide energy institute. This is back when biomass, biofuels was real hot. Um, we were very strong in petroleum, nuclear, uh, electric power, et cetera. And it made sense for Texas A&M to have such an institute, but I got the stiff arm. And so, Remessaging, proving what other universities were doing, benchmarking, I'm real big on benchmarking. So it took four years. And I was asked by 
all 12 department chairs in the College of Engineering and the dean to ask me, I was um, interim vice president for research at the time when I was asked to come back to engineering and form the Energy Institute. It took four years of socialization and all 12 department chairs put money on the table. So it's possible. So that's one of my messages in here. It still exists today. They've moved to the research part and they've developed formal um, degree programs, research programs, partnerships, and their, their, the governance structure is very strong to keep things going. So it can be done. I will talk about the engineering research centers um, a little bit later on as a, a very important framework. Um, in 1999, when I went to NSF the first time, I was a program director in this program, and the students in the room probably don't have a clue what this is. These centers are very difficult to get, and there is no UC campus that leads one today, by the way. We are partners in other ones, but it's a badge of honor to get one of these in engineering, and, and I'll talk about that in, uh, in a little bit. So my office. So um, as I've learned, the perception of the office of the president is we take all your money, and uh, that may be true, um, but this is such a, um, a privilege uh, to work here. Um, I knew what I was getting into. Um, I did a lot of homework. And when you look at it, this is our research playground. So most of my colleagues work with only the 10 campuses. But we have three DOE national labs. We have agriculture and natural resources. Uh, we have five medical uh, centers and six academic, uh, medical academic programs. I work with all of them. All of them are part of my research leadership. And that's how we came together to uh, go after the climate money, which I'll talk about in just a minute and some other initiatives. But as you as researchers and students think about how you can imagine and reimagine your work, just within the UC, you have a lot of partnership potential. So what my office does is um, we have, uh, we're home to the multi-campus research um, initiative. I think some of you have talked to me about grants you've received. So we have peer review, um, so part of my office is like a mini NSF NIH funding, so we have a lot of peer review. Um, I'm also um, in charge of the multi-campus research centers. And so the Institute for Transportation Studies, for example, is one of those MRUs. And um, that's kind of a, not the ITS, but the multi-campus opportunities here are a little bit um, disorganized, so I'll talk about that. Um, I'm, in, I'm responsible for research policy, and then I serve in these roles as strategist, and I, I'm sorry, IP management, and then, um, in my three and a half years here, I've had rich opportunities to facilitate these big initiatives, which I will talk about. I'm, uh, the Natural Reserve System is also led by my office, and uh, we are stewards of 41 sites across the state of California that represent the biodiversity of the state. Now, why is this important? It's not just to go to the park and have a picnic. We're actually networking these 41 sites to look at very important questions in climate change. And um, I'm also encouraging the executive director to look at these natural environments to inform how we look at human health, including mental health. So it's, we have exciting times ahead of us. The um, UC Observatories also reports to me, I'm just showing you this, to demonstrate that these multi-campus opportunities um, and programs are just uh, rich with um, the ability to make impact globally. So I hired Bruce McIntosh a little over a year ago from Stanford, but not only does he um, operate the observatory on Mount Hamilton, close to San Jose, but he's involved with international conversations on whether or not we set up the extremely large telescope, um, the 30 meter telescope um, in Hawaii. So this is part of my office. Now since I've come to UC, um, I've been told by several that what I'm showing you here has never been done before. So uh, some of you may recall in summer of 2021, um, I, um, 
hosted a series of wildfire symposia, and it was all by Zoom. This was after a brief conversation with three state agencies because I realized that we don't have a relationship with Sacramento. And so those symposia, we had about 1,500 attendees at each one. They were nationally, so people zoomed in from all over. And um, they were very successful, so we were invited to submit one proposal to the governor's office on climate action. So several of us, the entire research leadership that I showed you in that slide, the national labs, ag, et cetera, we all worked together for four months to submit one proposal so that we can pull in this money for the benefit of the faculty uh, to show how their work can impact in climate. The governor's office called again and uh, said, well, DOE has these hydrogen hub opportunities. They actually have these other earth shot opportunities. And so they called my office and said, can you work with us to lead in a hydrogen hub effort? So about three weeks ago, it was announced that California is receiving one of seven hydrogen hubs at 1.2 billion. So we're looking good with Sacramento right now. But another message here is that my office is now look, viewed as the place to go to build the system-wide opportunities. So now uh, the governor's office once again called to work on the CHIPS Act, so I'm doing that. We had a sprint back in the spring to look at possibly um, locating an ARPA-H investment catalyst hub here in California. And we're still working on transforming the innovation ecosystem uh, across the university. And finally, uh, this system-wide effort's been going on for three years now, led by Damon Tull here at UC Davis. The innovation ecosystem at the University of California, we had no data on the founders of our startup companies, if they're led by women or underrepresented minorities. We had no data on demographics of who's applying for patents. Um, who, you know, it, we had no data. So this group, um, after three years of big effort, figured out how to uh, tap data from four different databases and integrate it to start getting this type of data. It doesn't exist across the country. So USPTO is looking at this project, NSF is looking at this project, and uh, we're gonna lead the nation on how to do this. So let me talk about the profession. So back in 2017, this article appeared in Science, and one of my colleagues, Donna Riley, uh, who's now Dean of Engineering at the University of New Mexico, uh, wrote this uh, review of a movie called Dream Big. And it's a movie to try to engage uh, more people into the engineering profession. And she and I have had many, many discussions about our profession and how it's misunderstood. And the movie spotlighted engineers with hard hats. So when you think of engineer, and if you Google the word engineer, you'll see images, men and women with hard hats on. And, and we have a big perception problem here. And so um, this impacts federal funding. So I worked in the engineering directorate and I had an $11 million engineering education research program in my division. And I spent more time on that program than the ERCs or anything else because this is just not understood so well. We may think it is, but it's not. Um, so engineering is viewed as a science by many, and if you get into the practice of engineering, most people think it's not rigorous. This happens at NSF. And so often when you submit proposals that are more applied, they, they don't review as well. So the perspective of engineering is very heavy on civil, on construction, and if you look at the PE license, professional engineer's license, how many of you have one, by the way? Okay, that's pretty good. I have one. And why don't the rest of you have one? It's a credential of our profession. 
But if you go and look at the CEU courses to keep it active, they're mainly civil engineering related. The National Society of Professional Engineers about four years ago discontinued the software track. And I said, why are you doing that with AI and you know, all these emerging areas? And they said, because no one was taking the exam. So NSPE is actually revisiting how they test our engineers. So this is actually, uh, these are important uh, comments because we may take them for granted as engineers because we know who we are, but the rest of the world doesn't. They really don't. So let me just tell you a little bit here. So I was on a National Academy of Engineering Committee. I, I'm, it's still ongoing, looking at the extraordinary engineering impacts. So real quickly here, in the decades since Sputnik, which happened in 1957, there are two recurring themes, and you hear them today. The US competitiveness on the global stage and the quality of public education. Industries were offshoring. There were cycles of inflation and recession. Congress noticed. The White House noticed. And NSF noticed. And we've had many leaders since Sputnik. But what became apparent over the years is that for NSF to articulate for more budget for engineering, or for NSF as a whole, they would spotlight engineering achievements, not science. But when the budget increases came in, they supported basic science grants. And so within NSF, I can tell you, there is a culture tension between the engineering directorate and the rest of NSF. So um, engineering is viewed as a stepchild. Um, it's viewed as not as rigorous, and this is something we need to change. So really, the emergence of the engineering directorate at the federal level that supports academic research is in alignment with Sputnik in the moonshot discussion. So, um, for example, in 1968, Congress actually changed the charter of NSF to include applied research. Um, in that context, the research applied to national needs was launched. It doesn't exist anymore. But that was to address all these social um, challenges that we had, including environmental. It also encouraged um, academics to partner with industry. And that's still a challenge today in, at many universities. DARPA in 1975, the director of DARPA announced the DARPA questions, which I'm a big fan of, and I'll show you those in just a minute. But those questions can really guide how we can make impact. BIDOL was passed in 1980, and then in 81, the engineering directorate was finally established. But going along with this, as soon as the engineering directorate was established, the center's program was created. And the reason is to pull together the, the academic community with industry and to try to educate students to have meaningful careers in industry. The ERCs, the center's programs at NSF and other agencies have followed was around engineering education and not so much research. And that was a big surprise for me. So the final push by the NAE back then was that the practice of engineering is a key to the industrial competitiveness of the nation. While I was working at Texas A&M, I started asking the question in my mind of what the role of engineering is in academia. So when I was there and I just launched the Energy Institute, Deepwater Horizon happened. And you were at UT Austin, right? Texas A&M and other universities were called for emergency response. How can we cap the well? How can we uh, help humans who were suffering from the, the health consequences? How can we help animals? We had a big vet school. 
and how can we train more personnel to help with this emergency? And as you recall, it lasted for several months. I come to UC three days before the COVID shutdown and the entire system pulled together in a COVID response. My office questioned me as to why we were doing this. And I said, because research informs emergency response. And there's no other college on this campus or any other campus that could be out front in this messaging than engineering. Okay, so let's talk about the frameworks. So again, um, I was on this committee and um, we had a symposium a year ago to discuss engineering impacts. And this committee actually had a lot of debates about what impacts we were making. You know, do we have a new widget that came about or is there something cultural or is there something, you know, so it was a lot of debate, which is probably why the committee is still meeting. But um, I will say that um, the symposium highlighted people who made impacts, engineers, it highlighted how centers catalyze impacts, and we looked at even the funding vehicles. So NSF listens to the National Academy of Engineering, so we're hoping to make impact here. But we learned that the center's model framework is really not broken, and it actually has been core to engineering achievements today. So part of the framework, here are the DARPA questions. When I was an assistant professor, a former DARPA manager asked me um, about what I do in my work. And he stood up, crossed his arms, and he asked me, who cares, and walked out of my office. And that stuck with me. I was probably in my third year. And um, after that, every single proposal I wrote had that I had that question in my mind. My success rate shot up. So by the time I went up for tenure, I had a 43% success rate in uh, proposals and grants, and since then, very high. I bring this to your attention. These were crafted in 1975, but they could not be more important than they are today. You can Google these, they'll pop right up. What are you trying to do and who's going to care? And when you think about your own work, it may be in little niche areas of a bigger picture. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And you probably have seen past year's quadrant. It's another framing. So again, there's pressure in the federal funding uh, of research that you know the basic research is the meaningful research. But Congress and industry and society want impact. They want to see results. And so there's this tension between basic, applied, and implementation, deployment. And we talked about this model at NSF, and they still talk about it. So where do we prioritize limited budgets, and what impact do we want to make? So here is the Engineering Research Center's framework. And so what I did was map two of the DARPA questions at the top. What tends to happen is that faculty who apply for this center program, they're down here in the fundamental plane. So Professor A may have expertise in one block, Professor B, C, et cetera. But to actually come together for a bold 10-year vision is difficult if you don't start at the top. When you start with a bold vision, then you ask the question, who should be at the table? But often I see failed center happen because usually faculty will self-assemble with their colleagues without looking at the big vision. So if you want to make a real impact that requires several years down the road, like putting man on the moon, you have to start at the top. So I'm showing you this chart to try to shift your thinking from the academic level where we all tend to sit and to think about what we're trying to do. When you look at the climate action grants that we just awarded, $100 million, the successful 
uh, teams actually started at the top and they asked the question, what impact do we want to make with communities? And then they pulled their teams together. A very important framework, I actually use this in my job every day. This is how I think. Now as an example, one of the speakers, and I encourage you to go online to look at the seminars from that symposium. This one is from um, Professor Mike Silovich at Northeastern. He had an engineering research center on subsurface sensing and imaging, very, very successful. He then used this three-plane chart to go after a DHS center, which was so successful that DHS funded him again. So 10 years DHS, then he got another center with DHS to use the um, results from the engineering research center. So he stuck with this framework. But what is this one? Now he's using it for broadening participation to improve diversity in engineering. So he developed a vision on what that looks like and then pulled teams nationally in this um, really richly funded NSF program. The three-plane chart, most, most people hate it until they understand it. And I'm presenting it to you after looking at your strategic plan and thinking, okay, how can you achieve some of the goals of your strategic plan? And I encourage you to take a look at this model. Now, implications, uh, talking about community um, and climate, they tend to, climate signatures tend to impact vulnerable communities more. So uh, these articles popped out a couple of years ago. The Latino populations, 19% um, of the U.S. Uh, are Latino, uh, and 37% live in areas where extreme wildfire is a risk. That's a lot of people. And so when we take a hard look at communities, and the successful climate action teams did this, and ask, what do those communities need and how can my expertise contribute to their uh, solution space? That's where you're gonna achieve impact. The statistics are, are, are startling and um, it's, it's, this is where you should start your homework and then think about how you can contribute. So your strategic plan, I love it, I love it. Um, you have very important goals. I love that uh, your core value is engineering a better world for all. This community goal is very, very important, and I would argue that that is the most difficult. And Rich, congratulations. This is, this is really a very nice strategic plan, and I would invite you to think about those frameworks, to think about how to achieve important goals with limited resources. So I'll conclude that, um, yeah, life is a journey, not a destination, but the profession of engineering is a mindset. I, I finally got Lockheed Martin to see that when they, we had a disconnect on the types of students they were looking for. Engineering is a process and it's a framework to make impact. So good engineers are really good systems thinkers. They're integrators and they're collaborators. We have a complex world and more than ever the students in the room need to think about how your work and your contributions are gonna make a bigger impact. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Must be some questions. Okay, Michele. Oh, hi. Hi, Teresa, how are you doing? Good, good to Thank see you. Thank you for, very nice to see you. Thank you for this presentation. As always, very inspiring. Uh, I wanted to uh, pick up on something that you were saying at the end on why we generally start from uh, 
the baseline, or the, the base of the three planes on research. And, and then it's a difficulty to reach uh, the top plane. Um, one of the issues uh, that uh, we start seeing uh, in our career is that a lot of uh, the valuations, merits, all of that, the incentives that are pushing us are really directing us toward uh, a fake type of impact that is uh, age factor and stuff like that. Um, there is uh, obviously a difficulty in measuring real impacts in society because it requires time, effort, right. and usually no one gives you anything back for it, so why do it? So it's really a question of uh, culture within yeah. uh, departments, colleges, campuses on how to reach that point. Do you have uh, any recommendation on uh, where to go and how to reach that change in culture uh, that would help us uh, so that's much a, uh, yeah. into doing real uh, world impact? That's a great question. It's a Thank very you. important question. The uh, reward structures are misaligned. Um, um, I think you have a really great dean who is open. I mean, UT, <laughs> UT Austin had ERCs, uh, chemical engineering, and um, part of another one. Um, don't remember the other one. Um, yeah, the MERSEX. But um, this is a, a, a real serious conversation to have in your college and, and to um, socialize the importance of doing this type of work. Uh, changing culture is not easy. Um, at Texas A&M, it took me four years to convince 12 department chairs to come together. And um, faculty across the A&M system do work through that institute and they, they're given credit. So it took time, but the conversation has to be on the table. Um, <clears throat> you have to, keep messaging. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know if you want to make a declaration that this is a priority. We, but we, we had it. We were finalists for an ERC uh, about a year and a half ago or so. We had a site visit and got really close and just didn't quite get there. But it, it is something that we want to, you know, as you said, is, is what is the what are you trying to solve? What's the mm -hmm. problem? And then put the right teams together from here and other universities as as um, as collaborators. We need to be thinking bigger. And it does bring, I mean, ERCs are amazing because you've got years and years of funding for the ERC, but all sorts of spin-offs around it and opportunities for external partnerships with industry. And, and as Teresa said, if you do it right, it's, it's going to bring more decades of, mm -hmm. of, of research funding. So. Well, you triggered something that your external partners yeah. are critical. And so, like, my external advisory board when I was dean, they would talk to the president and say, you know, engineering, the engineering college should be in a position to support Lockheed Martin or, you know, the utility, you know. Um, your external partners can play a big role there. Yeah, I wanted to say, Teresa, I'm, my field is sort of a uh, living embodiment of some of the things you said. So for decades, those of us who worked in the indoor air quality field struggled for research funding. We would go to the National Science Foundation and we'd always be told, this is too health related, go to NIH. Yeah. And then you'd go to NIH and NIH would say, you're an engineer, why are you talking to us, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so we really fell through the cracks. Yeah. And then the pandemic hit and everybody's wondering where all the, where all the indoor air quality research was, right? Mm -hmm. We were very unprepared for dealing with the pandemic when it hit. Well, I don't think engineering was at the table enough during the pandemic. No, I mean, there were many of us who were screaming from the rooftops trying to get, trying to get at the table, and we had a hard time with it. Mm -hmm. Had engineers been at the table at the start of the pandemic, I think we would have been in better shape today. Because uh, Georgia Tech actually did that, and, uh, you know, because it's an engineering um, yeah. institute, and um, they, they drove leadership in Atlanta and partnered with CDC and Emory, yep. but yep. the engineers drove it. Yep. More questions? Yes, from students. Yeah, and then Negrin after. Next. Good afternoon. My name is Estina Rosendiz Ortiz, an undergraduate aerospace engineering student. And I suppose your discussion was amazing. I was just wondering, as an undergraduate, how can we bridge that disconnect 
between leadership and engineering. As engineers, we have the power to be innovative and create amazing things, but we can't necessarily control where that innovation ends up right. and how it's used. So how, as we're starting on a new generation of engineers and innovation, how can we be a part of that discussion and control what best way to use engineering in? Mm, great question, I love that. Um, I think um, um, to answer that, uh, I, I see you have good uh, discussions with your peers in engineering, but talk to students outside of engineering as well, and that socializes our profession to them as well. And um, I, um, I don't remember if I mentioned, I started a student energy club immediately. I seated them with ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 just to see what they would do with it, let them run with it. They pulled together students from all across the campus, from every college, and uh, they did amazing things. They organized incredible programs, got uh, visitors from Washington, D.C., et cetera. So um, first thing I would say is uh, talk to your peers outside of engineering and, and have a dialogue about, okay, if we were to look at this social challenge or you know what ifs, that might be kind of an interest. Actually, I've been wanting to form a student climate think tank you know, to put the students' minds that are, tend to be unconstrained to talk about climate but I'm not sure how to do that. <laughs> School of Medicine represented here. So Kim, can you raise your hand for the students? Okay, so, and are there other colleges represented here or schools today? All right, well, School of Medicine and the College of Engineering go together like peanut butter and jelly. So we need to continue to grow that relationship and get our students working with each other. Negrin, you had a question? And then Micah. First, thank you, Teresa, for this inspiring talk. Uh, I'm Nestor Sarigil Klein, as we just met, uh, from Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department. Um, I love the way you started your talk with space, uh, space race, yeah. because <laughs> <laughs> I actually started space engineering graduate program here in 2001. That was the beginning of space activities here at, at our college and university. Uh, my question to you is, we went to the moon, in fact, for those of you who are students, we, they didn't even use computers at all. They did everything using slide rules. Engineers yes. will know what that means, and yes. I can talk with you on that. As far as um, uh, getting to the moon, the way it happened is there was a declaration of emergency, right? right? right. Okay. So it was my reactionary, next question, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. My next question is the the next crisis associated with energy, right? So to accomplish our goals, thank you for doing good work there, but to accomplish our goals as a nation, we do need to declare emergency and allow, without any bias, any kind of proposed technologies to be integrated. Right. Reason I bring this up, this is more a comment and a, a question to you is, since you are sitting at a position where you can influence others, perhaps, try to get a decision made so we declare emergency and emer energy crisis. Thank Very you. Very nice, yes. And um, the first step with this round of funding was uh, from the state was to get the state to trust us. And, and I'm hoping the PI teams will deliver. Um, and, um, you know, we had to build that relationship. And, and so I'm hoping to get more. But yes, you're absolutely correct. And climate issues don't stop at the border of California. So, um, but we need to get organized in the state. And um, I think people in state government are starting to realize that the academics can play a role. But when I first got here, I can tell that that relationship was not very good as a whole. Micah? Hi, thank you so much for your talk. I'm Micah Zonavard. And um, I really support having uh, students uh, join a, a climate effort. Climate is my, my um, topic, so I um, oh, very much so support that. Um, in terms of some of the slides you showed, you've also showed the disproportionate impact that minorities often face yes. when, you know, in the face of a changing, uh, uh, in the, the face of climate change, but in your three-tier system, those stakeholders, 
that are central to writing successful proposals, for example, often getting those minorities recognized as people that actually need tools is very hard. So, so pitching someone else as a stakeholder, for example, I don't know, wildfires in, in a grander sense, is often an easier sell. And I was wondering if you could speak to that because I think we're all agreed that we need to support minorities that are disproportionately effect affected. But how can we do that in the sense of how can we actually get projects off the ground that are targeted at that type of flexibility? A um, uh, very important question. Uh, what I did when we developed the RFP last year for, the, for these grants, um, I, um, I have someone in my office who runs the Breast Cancer Research Program, Mel Kavanaugh Lynch. She has expertise in community engagement and we pulled together faculty with that expertise from around the system and together they produced Appendix B of that RFP. And so um, it was a start to try to guide PIs to think about how to do it because if, if, um, if you go out and engage with a community and don't have the proper way to dialogue with them, you can actually ruin a potential relationship from the very beginning and it's hard to recover. So um, the, the, that's a, it's a difficult um, process, but I'm hoping to build up that expertise in my office to help faculty around the system. But you do have experts here on your campus. Um, I'll, I'll try to find out who the Davis representative was if I'm answering your question correctly. But you know, if you go into these communities and with the attitude like, oh, hey, we're from the university, we're here to save you, that's not gonna go anywhere. Yeah, you, I mean, my experience is you really need to develop relationships with community organizations. Um, they're the ones that have the relationships and work closely with them, it's so important. I, I'm going, Micah, did you have one more question? We have last, last, right. last. <laughs> I meant more, more in terms of how can you get funding to actually go into those communities. So not necessarily how to build up that, that relationship, but right. what, what, um, yeah, what funds are available? Yeah, the climate that? funds are actually being used to do that. Um, and uh, the fifth climate assessment also had a um, competition. But uh, this is a discussion that I can continue with the governor's office, the Office of Planning and Research, and uh, to socialize the um, interest by our faculty to do this type of work more effectively and, and to plan in their budgets to support this type of work. But right now, there's not that confidence. But I can have that conversation. I'm not going to say I'll be successful, but I'm going to try. So we're going to have to end now, but I want to please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Teresa Maldonado again for an inspiring presentation. And on behalf of the College of Engineering, uh, Teresa, we're going to give you a, a bag of treats. And you don't have to open it now. It's heavy. It is heavy. I don't know what's in it, actually. It's, so you've got a College of Engineering bowling ball. And I think I have one of your bricks. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much.